Once again, we have plenty of news this week. My name is Mark, let's talk rugby. On our agenda this week, first up we have the under 20 Rugby World Cup that has just finished in South Africa last weekend. Then the Rugby Championship, we've had the second round of that. Johnny Sexton gets himself a ban. And then finally, the Lions have announced their fixtures for the 2025 Tour of Australia. So let's start with the Under 20s Rugby World Cup first. So I did a preview and coverage of the final. The final was between Ireland Under 20s and France Under 20s. France Under 20s absolutely demolished Ireland. Very much the deserved winners I feel because they were the best team throughout the competition Ireland I think stood out as the second best but never really hit that high that they hit in the under 26 nations you know they did have a lot of adversity to to go through you know with uh, some tragedy and stuff on the on the tour and stuff like that but still you know they're young guys, they're going to learn from this, but you can't take anything away from France. Like, uh, you know, even if Ireland were on their best form, they would have found it very hard to live with that French team, I felt, at times in that game. France just, you know, it was kind of a little bit tight early on, a bit of nip and tuck. Ireland actually took the lead, France then come over the top of them, and then they just start stretching away and being able to score, you know, length of the field tries and breakout tries and stuff. And Ireland just didn't really have a response. Ireland, I feel like, you know, it's one thing that Ireland have to add, not just under 20s level, but also at senior level as well, is that they're very structured in the play. If they can get control of things and they can pile on pressure and they, they can force you into mistakes and they can ratchet up scores just through pressure. But Ireland find it very hard to score the way France did, which is, just broken play, get in behind and just have the killer instinct to finish. The Irish team just isn't built like that. Maybe it's something that, you know, they're going to add on in the future now that they've got certain structures in place. We're probably going to see more players who have that kind of natural ability coming through as well because, you know, that's the way it is. Like, is you increase your depth, you increase the skill level of the players who are available and then suddenly you're not, just picking between the guy who is maybe skillful, has that X factor, and the guy who can do things, you know, nine out of ten times absolutely spot on the correct way, but not necessarily having much flair. Once you get more depth, you can have the the choice to pick between a guy that, that can do both of those. And I don't think Ireland are just there yet. It's something that's going to have to happen in the future. France, they've just got nat- that natural flair in them and they just had more, too much for Ireland on the day. So congratulations to them on the victory. South Africa then finished third overall to be England in the third and fourth place playoff. A bit tighter game there, 22-15, but South Africa coming through in the end in that one and you know given that they they kind of struggled in in their pool and almost got knocked out it's a decent result for them i feel that they never really troubled you know the uh irish really in the in their semi-final once it kind of got past a certain stage and the same with england with france as well england gave france a game early on but then Franches had a little bit extra to go through. So I think in terms of the top four, certainly finished in the right order. And then it was Australia who finished fifth, Wales finished sixth, New Zealand seventh, and Georgia eighth. And then I'm not sure with the others who finished in what order. I know Italy and Argentina won their playoffs, but I'm not sure who was for uh ninth and tenth and who was for eleventh and twelfth but I think Japan finished twelfth probably and Fiji finished tenth. I think that's right. Yeah so overall I think you know we're kind of seeing in the last few under twenties uh world championships where Northern Hemisphere are beginning to catch up at that age level to the Southern Hemisphere. France have won the last three 
that have been played now the last two before this were 2019 and 2018 because of covid but still shows it that they have so much talent coming through and a lot of these french players are eligible to play next year as well so ireland or new zealand australia england whoever you know feel like they're, they're going to challenge them next year are going to have to come up with a very special crop of young players i think to take that title off them now on to the rugby championship so we had the second round of fixtures and because it's truncated to three it really was the one that is probably going to be the most decisive in the whole championship so a top table clash new zealand 35 south africa 20 so new zealand get out to a good start they're leading at 20 points to three at half time then South Africa bring it back to 2010, but that's as close as they get. South Africa do slightly win the second half, but New Zealand were kind of home and dry by the time they got their, their final try. So there was no, no real spark of South Africa maybe coming back. I talked about at half time though that South Africa are one of the teams that do have that in their locker. And surprisingly, not many teams at test level who can actually do that, you know, like New Zealand obviously have it in their locker. Uh, Australia can do it sometimes. South Africa sometimes as well. Um, England kind of can do it in a blue moon, similar to the likes of uh, Scotland as well can do it in a blue moon. Ireland, I think, are probably of the of the top tier teams, the one that would struggle most to come back from 15 or 20 points down because like their under 20s team, they're built on structure and applying pressure. And when a team has a 20 point cushion, the pressure just, just doesn't apply as it would if it was a tight game. So, you know, I thought South Africa would maybe make a game, but they really couldn't. New Zealand though are looking really hot and it's kind of a warning shot to the rest of the world going into the world cup as well that they really are coming into good form and they're beginning to kind of get a bit more clarity on who plays where i think moanga played really well at 10 and i think any debate between him and mckenzie should be kind of you know done now because of mckenzie mckenzie's kicking against um argentina in the first round and but then for south africa they really have questions about who their 10 is going to be because Leboc did fairly well against Australia first up. And I felt that Willemse, you know, kind of struggled a bit against New Zealand. Again, it's kind of hard where if, if your pack isn't on top, it's kind of hard to judge 10s one against the other. But still, you know, he wasn't doing the kicking. It started off with Faf de Clark doing the kicking. Then Colby took over the kicking. And like if he's the 10, unless, unless, you know, it's, um, kind of a French team where you might see the nine kicking. Generally, for South Africa, especially, you expect the nine to be kicking and also be running the kicking strategy. And I felt like he played more like a fullback, filling in a 10 rather than, rather than a natural 10. So, a lot of questions about that and questions about the players who come into the team as well. You know, I felt like a lot of them didn't live up to the standard that the guys set against Australia in the first game. Now, opposition obviously plays a lot into that as well, but still, you know, South Africa, I think they've got to now in the next game against Argentina start arriving at those kind of answering those questions about who are who is your starting front row who's your starting locks who you starting back row half backs etc because i'm not sure that they're, they're really there and even like the back three you can have questions like you know curtly aronson did so well um against australia so does he deserve to to get a go um in in kind of the first team as it were against argentina and if he does well there then is he going to be a starter in the world cup the other one then was australia 31 argentina 34 so this one went back and forward between the two teams australia were actually winning with three minutes to go all they had to do was keep hold of the ball give away a silly penalty argentina able to kick up the field and then they go over to score to try that wins it for them so 
you know, not not good game management from them. Question marks over Cooper playing at ten, but I feel about Australia because of of how they've been like very up and down team. You know, with Eddie now, but also with Rennie before them, that there's always only question marks about the ten for Australia because they don't have anyone who is absolutely head and shoulders above anyone else. You know, they used to have Foley there last year. They had um, Cooper, Gordon, come on, looked good against South Africa. Does Gordon get a game against Argentina now? And if he does well, does that mean that he's automatically the number 10 for the Rugby World Cup? I, I don't honestly, uh, or sorry, against New Zealand, not against Argentina. Uh, but if he does well against New Zealand, does that mean he's he's the number 10 for the Rugby World Cup? I'm not sure. I think with us, uh, as an Australian 10, you're like one bad performance away from people calling for you to be dropped and never to play for the Wallabies again. And then to just kind of rotate someone else in who was dropped before and kind of start all over again. So a lot of work, I think, for the Wallabies to do, not just in the pack, but also in the backs as well. I felt that Skelton looked a little bit better, still not looking up to the form that we see him with La Rochelle. Eddie's going to have to unlock that very quickly before the Ruby World Cup. Argentina going to be delighted with this win. Didn't really do themselves just as against New Zealand, got blown away early on and couldn't really muster a response. But in this one, you know, they kept coming back out of Australia and then they got ahead there at the end. That's going to give them a lot of confidence going into that final game against South Africa. They're really going to give that one a go. And if they win that one, they're going to be on such a high going into the Rugby World Cup as well. And, you know, Argentina and Rugby World Cup, I feel, is a different beast. So if they go in there with any kind of confidence, you really don't want to be, you know, put up against them. Uh, they do have, like, a tough draw, but still... Uh, they, they can they they can upset the apple cart we've seen before in rugby world cups. I think with Australia, the thing problem they have now is they got New Zealand, New Zealand, and France before their rugby world cup kicks off against Georgia. If they haven't sorted anything out by then, you could absolutely see Georgia causing a massive upset there in that one, or at least running them close. And it's really not what you want for your opening game in a Rugby World Cup if you're coming in on the back of possibly what would be five defeats on the bounce for Eddie. Now, if they win any one of those games, suddenly everything t turns around and that spark there could be enough for them to maybe even top their pool. So it's very kind of on a knife edge for them, I feel, at the moment. But the next round of fixtures then is going to be this weekend coming up. So... um. Sorry, it's next, it's the weekend after, it's 29th of July. You've got Australia hosting New Zealand and South Africa versus Argentina. South Africa really should win that one against Argentina. Given that they're at home, if it was the other way around, you might think give Argentina a, a chance in it. But as I said, South Africa really have to sort out, out their team before the, the Rugby World Cup. Australia at home, you know, they'll, they'll give it a go. That's what I say on the ready, they'll definitely give it a go, but I think New Zealand are going to have too much for them there. Okay, the next piece of news then we have is Johnny Sexton. He got a three match ban for, you know, his behavior towards Jaco Piper and the other officials as well after the Champions Cup defeat to La Rochelle in May. You know, um, I think three matches was probably where most people were thinking it was going to be. I'm not talking about fairness, I'm just talking about where people thought it would be because that covers the war of games and means that he's free to play in the World Cup. And that kind of, you know, messes a little with, bit with Ireland's preparations because does this mean now that he's got to play against, against Romania, a game that he probably, you wouldn't have thought that he'd be, be playing in? So does he have to now play in that one and then in the Tonga game as well and if he plays in the two of those then you have like you know it's um like South Africa and Scotland I think right after that so 
does it mean that Johnny Sexton is going to play all four of the pool games, then possibly get injured in the last one, and then somebody else has to step in cold into a quarterfinal the way we've seen in the past. So that's going to be kind of interesting there with that one. I've seen people, you know, um, say that he should have got longer. Honestly, as a Leinster fan, a big Johnny Sexton fan, and an Arla fan, I actually agree with that. I think he should have got longer. I I can see the reason why that the disciplinary panel did not want to end his career because because they possibly could have they have given him like an eight match ban or something like that or twelve or or and, you know something in that vein. But I think that you know so I can understand that point of view. But I think that for the offence that it should have been longer than than three games, but. As an Ireland fan, I'm very relieved that it wasn't three games, you know, and that we can actually see Johnny in the World Cup. Now, something I don't agree was with, I saw Stephen Ferris come, coming out uh, during the week and he said that the panel had denied Ireland fans seeing Johnny Sexton play his last, ga- like, a farewell game in Dublin before ending his Ireland career. I don't re- agree with that at all. I don't think that should have factored into to anything like that. And again, I think that as Ireland fans, we should not be looking at it like that, that he's denied this kind of, you know, farewell party or whatever, that we should just think that we are very lucky that he did not get a longer ban because he absolutely could have, and he absolutely could have, you know, meant that his career was done, that he wasn't, wasn't even going to travel to the World Cup because there was no way they was going to play even if Ireland got to a final. So that's the news on that one. Uh, I think Leinster got like a, a suspended, yeah, they got suspended fine of 7,500 euros for kind of their part and things as well. I don't think it's going to affect, you know, Johnny's conduct in the future. He's only got a few games left now that I don't think he's he's going to change. But I don't think we're going to see him being in the position either where he's kind of in a suit coming onto the pitch at the end of a game either. So, you know, maybe if Ryan get knocked out and he's injured or something, you might see that. And it would be kind of sad for the blot his copybook by doing it again at the end, the very end of his career. But yeah, I think that He's probably going to be on the, on the field for any of his future interactions with referees. Also, there was talk about, you know, what happens to him now in terms of Ireland captaincy. I think he's absolutely going to be the Ireland captain if he's on the field. And there's two reasons for that. One, I think he is probably the best captain that we have available anyway. Um, and two is the fact that if he wasn't captain, he's not going to shut up. And so he's going to be there giving it all the mouth that he normally does, but not be the captain. And he's going to get spoken to by the referee and whoever the captain is, be it Peter Manny or whoever, will be told to, to tell him to, to keep quiet. He won't keep quiet and he's going to start giving away penalties because of it. So I absolutely think that he's going to be the captain for the reason that he's the best captain available. And two, because if he wasn't captain, it might actually be a problem. I said before, I absolutely do not condone his conduct. I don't condone conduct like that from, from any players. I don't, I don't think it's, it's right. I, I like players to be, you know, competitive and to be aggressive and stuff like that. But, but when you're just abusing the referee, it's not on. It's not right. And that's what we, that's what he was doing. Like he was effing and blinding at him after it. And I'm sure he was upset about things, but, you know, Yako has a job to do as well, and, and it's not the right thing to do. So hopefully he has a good World Cup. Hopefully Yako has a good World Cup as well. And, you know, hopefully he does actually learn something from this for the last few games that he has. But in terms of the overall thing for referees, I, I do think that they, they should have given him a longer ban because... You know, and if it happens again to anyone in the World Cup, whether it's an Irish player or from any nation, they really should uh, come down on them hard. But now that they've kind of set this precedent, they're going to find it difficult to do that, especially if it is, again, another player who is off field rather than, you know, being on the field 
at the time that their incident happens as well. So that's the Johnny Sexton one. And then the final one then is the British and Irish Lions 2025 Tour to Australia. So they've announced their uh, their game. So kicks off in Australia the 2nd of July against the Queens and Reds in Brisbane. 5th of July, the Waratahs in Sydney. 9th of July, the Brumbies in Canberra. 12th of July, Invitational Australia and New Zealand team in Adelaide. We'll come back and talk about that in a second. 19th of July is the first test versus Australia in Brisbane. 22nd of July, Melbourne Rebels in Melbourne. So that's obviously going to be dirt trackers. 26th of July, the second test versus Australia in Melbourne. 2nd of August, the third test versus Australia in Sydney. So no force on there and, you know, very shortened tour. have to say... You know, the probably the, the tour that I enjoyed most, someone who came kind of to rugby later on in my sports following um, kind of life, as it were, was the 2005 tour of New Zealand, where it was, you know, all the games were on very early in the morning. And, you know, we got absolutely pumped in the in the tests and you know Clive Woodward was kind of living in 2003 with the teams he picked as well but I really enjoyed the tour all the same like just having so many games and a build-up and it was actually a really great bonding experience for myself my younger brother who kind of around that time we didn't get on the best and then my dad but by the end of it we were all like every time the games were on just getting up really early in the morning and kind of bonding over that was really great, uh, you know, experience to have. But since then, like my kind of enjoyment and my attachment to the lines has kind of waned and kind of the, as the tour has gotten smaller, my excitement for the tour has diminished as well. And it's not necessarily about that the tour is getting smaller, just that the, the lines themselves is not as big a thing for me anymore. You know, uh, it's it's a nice concept, but, you know, it's not like the, for me, it's not the pinnacle anymore, whereas before it was. Now it's, you know, Rugby World Cup, Six Nations, Heineken Cup, URC, uh, then maybe the lines after that, really, if I'm honest. But, you know, it's it's still going to be uh, exciting. I think generally the Lions Australia is probably the the most winnable tour for the Lions, given like that they have such a short time to come together as a team. And Australia are generally kind of the, the third rank of those, you know, big Southern Hemisphere powerhouses as well. So it's something to look forward to. But, but for me, at least not with as much gusto as I did in the past. I said I'd talk about the Invitational one as well, Australia and New Zealand team. So I'm sure people will be picking now and, and all the way up to there, like what their 23 would be for that. But for me, you know, Australia have a first test the, you know, one week later. They're probably not going to risk, you know, if they've got a good idea of who their test team is, probably not going to risk too many starters in that game, the New Zealand team as well, it's invitational. So you might, you might get some players who are kind of towards the end of their New Zealand career, or maybe aren't even playing for the All Blacks anymore either. You know, it might start out as this big thing of, oh, it's going to be the best of Australia and New Zealand. And then slowly just trying to chip away to it being, you know, a fairly decent side, but, but not the 15 that you would pick if you were if you were doing a combined team between them i think as well with with the uh lines as well it's probably going to be kind of a last chance saloon for players to put the hand up for selection for the first test i think a lot of the maybe starting first test players will be rested and other kind of players who are kind of it's maybe a coin toss between two players they will get game time in that game and then they'll decide maybe start the guy who they think will be in the test if they have a good game pull them off and keep them ready for the test i think that's probably the way that will go but you know let let me know about any of the what you think about any of the stuff that happened this year under strength 
you know, under 20s Rugby World Cup, what were your thoughts on that? How did your nation go on that? And where do you think they need to go for the future? You know, if they're kind of falling away and if it's kind of Ireland, what do we need to do to kind of get up to France's level for that? We're able to do it in the under 26 nations, but can we reach the level that it, that they reached in the final the rugby championship then as well? You know, it's kind of, it's almost, let's say at the moment in the order where they're going to finish, but do you think there are going to be any surprises in the final round? Johnny Sexton, what do you think of his band? Do you think he should have got longer? What do you think about this whole thing of Stephen Ferris saying that he's missing a farewell in Dublin? Do you think that's a valid argument or not? And then finally, the lines to what you think of the fixtures and you know, um, what do you think of the tour overall? What are your sentiments towards it? Is it still like the pinnacle for you?